Welcome back, everybody. It's your favorite investment strategist, Larry. And today we are talking about a very important topic, whether it is time for Chinese internet stocks to roar back because of the following reasons related to diverging central banking policies between China and the rest of the world. I'm gonna be walking you through those divergences. I'm going to be talking about whether the economy can reaccelerate in China and what that implies for the stock market there. We'll talk about China's role in global inflation and how that might impact US equities here back at home I'll discuss the ongoing risks that you need to know, and then we'll talk about the broad rebound that is brewing in the Chinese internet ETF KWeb, which, by the way, is a major proxy for Alibaba, Tencent, JD, and Baidu. So with that said, let's get straight into it. I wanna talk about the diverging central banking practices that's happening between China and the rest of the world right now. And here's a table to help you understand that difference. Here in the US, we are seeing that there is a growing consensus for at least three rate hikes in 2022. There's talk about a balance sheet runoff. There's also a discussion that we are entering a phase of quantitative tightening than quantitative easing. So in the US, we are starting to see the monetary policy tighten, whereas in China, they are keeping the monetary policy accommodative and they're keeping it flexible. And in fact, they might add more support for key areas in their economy, such as real estate, based on an article that was recently published on Bloomberg. So while the US is in tightening mode, China is going into easing mode with a greater potential for more cuts in its reserve requirement ratio in the coming months. Now, we can see here that because of China's diverging monetary policy from the rest of the world, this is going to have serious implications for where investor capital is likely to be allocated. Once again, you can see that China's central banking chief is going to support policy growth as they try to keep GDP above that critical 5% threshold. Here in the US, there are growing calls for at least a half point rate hike in the foreseeable future, and then more hikes later this year. And this is coming at a time when the 2022 forecast for US GDP is going to moderate down from last year. Last year was 5.5% GDP growth. This year, we're looking at 3.6 to 4.5% growth for the US. In China, they're trying to do whatever it takes to defend that 5% growth rate. And if they can, I believe that their equities, especially in the internet sector, which are sensitive to consumption and the broader broader economic conditions is likely to benefit. And I'll discuss that later today. Now, there is one caveat that I want to discuss. There have been a lot of academic research papers and institutional research papers written and highly documented on the fact that short-term funds and monetary policy impacts the U.S. equity market and the Chinese equity market in different ways. Specifically, for China, the short-term rates has a short-term impact on the stock market, but the Chinese stock market is much more sensitive to economic data, whereas the U.S. stock market really places a lot of its emphasis on interest rates with economic data being somewhat secondary. So that's an important note because monetary policy impacts North American and Chinese stock markets different. But because China's stock market is more sensitive to economic data, if monetary easing helps to boost the Chinese economy, I expect Chinese internet stocks to react strongly to this data. So take note of that. Now, when it comes to analyzing China's current economy, I want to give you a big picture of what analysts and economists are currently looking at. And we're gonna start at looking 
at the Purchasing Manager Index, short for PMIs. Now, if you don't know what PMIs are and why they're important, allow me to explain. PMIs are a very important leading economic indicator. In other words, it's an indicator that helps analysts and economists forecast what is the future business conditions that are likely to take place in the economy through its survey and official data. And for that reason, the PMI is one of the more followed economic data points that comes out when the US and Chinese government release it on a scheduled basis. Now, when we look at the US PMI, we're gonna study it from a five-year chart, we're gonna study it from a one-year chart, and then we're gonna contrast that to China's PMI, and we're gonna think about this in the context of the monetary policy. We can see that in a five-year horizon, the US PMI is above that 50 threshold, where above 50, PMI indicates that the economy is an expansionary phase. Under 50, it indicates that the economy is potentially in a contracting phase. Now, even though that US PMI is currently above 50, if we zoom in to the one-year chart, we could see that since the summer of 2021, PMI seems to have peaked, and since then it has fallen quite significantly. If this trend continues, it won't be long until PMI reaches the, that 50 threshold that a lot of economists and analysts follow. Now, here's what's important to really digest. The Fed is raising rates at a time when US PMI is falling. In other words, the Fed is raising rates as the US economy is actually slowing down. And that is potentially a very dangerous combination that I will be following uh, month over month. Now, in China, we can see that PMIs are close to that 50 level, so it's relatively soft data. In fact, there was a period of contraction uh, in late 2021, and now we're somewhat above that 50 threshold. But the bottom line is that China's PMI has been relatively stable and range bound. And even though that there's no clear trend, here is what's happening. China's monetary policy is likely to ease. So because the reserve requirement ratio is going to fall, and as I'll talk about later today, they're looking to loosen restrictions on real estate, it's possible that this PMI in China is going to stabilize and eventually recover. But the Fed is raising rates at a time when PMI is falling, so that's a, that's a delicate situation to closely observe. So that observation that I just pointed out Definitely have that in the back of your minds as these PMIs are released every month. Now, another important economic metric to look at is US and China retail sales. The reason that's important is it helps us understand the strength of consumption. In the US, consumer consumption is 70% of US GDP. In China, it's 50 to 55%. Now we can see that US retail sales are definitely on a rebound since that fourth quarter of 2021. It is still relatively range bound. And what that means is without additional stimulus, it's possible that these retail sales figures could have downward pressure if Fed funds rates go up too quickly. And so that hawkish sentiment that you see in the media could hurt consumer confidence given that stimulus is no longer on the table. Now, Chinese retail sales are also relatively modest when it comes to its monthly growth. But another thing that you wanna pay attention to is it's very steady, it's very stable. And that also means that coming from a consolidated and stable base, if China's monetary easing makes its way into the consumer consumption trends, it's possible that these retail sales numbers start to build up from a depressed base. And that will have a lot of positive tailwinds for commerce-driven companies like Alibaba and Meituan and JD. So 
because consumer confidence is more directly tied to U.S. equity valuations, that is a metric that we want to follow closely. And it's important in China too, but we understand consumer confidence through a different route. And we understand it through real estate. And as I'll discuss soon, it's because 70% of Chinese household wealth is through real estate. So when we're thinking about how consumer confidence is going to play into retail sales in China, it's the way you look at it is different from the U.S. The way you look at it is you have to understand where real estate is going because that's where most of the household wealth is, and therefore that will help you understand where retail sales are going to go. So let's dive into the health of China's real estate market, which is a very popular source of discussion when it comes to understanding the future of China's economy in the intermediate term. Now I want to revisit a very important policy that was issued. Back in August 2020, and that policy, for those of us who follow the Chinese markets closely, is known as China's Three Red Lines. And these were policies designed to stop over-leveraging in the property sector. These were policies designed to help China to. Get rid of that speculative froth that was really、uh, making housing unaffordable for the average citizen. The three lines includes ratios and restrictions to ensure that property firms were not overly leveraged and ensure that liquidity metrics were in certain parameters. And if these lines were breached, that would prevent these property firms from. Taking on additional debt and stopping their ability to borrow, and of course, these limits caused a lot of issues for major real estate developer Evergrande and other Chinese property companies. But long term, this will cause the property market to not overheat, remove a lot of leverage from the system, and make property a much safer part of China's. Economic growth strategy, even if it structurally slows the growth prospects in this sector. Now, because 70% of Chinese household wealth is in real estate, compared to 35% in the U.S., this is a very important sector to follow if we want to understand how retail sales and understand even how PMI is going to play out in the foreseeable future. So, given that real estate is 70% of Chinese household wealth and 25% of China's national GDP. When you account for other industries associated with real estate, this is an area that if you can forecast what will happen in the future, you will understand where the general equity market direction is likely heading towards. Now, let's discuss some recent headlines that have surfaced. From major media outlets, so back in January there was an article about Chinese developer sales tumble in January, and of course headlines like this capture a lot of attention. But another consideration that I urge you to focus on is that January is one month throughout the year. We look at real estate transactions. Usually on a quarterly or semi-annual basis, looking at real estate information on a monthly basis may or may not necessarily be very helpful. The reason for that is there's seasonality involved, and in January, which is the month leading up to Chinese New Year, it's likely that real estate transactions don't necessarily occur at this part of the year. So when you see these media outlet articles. Uh, very informative and very helpful to give you a great context in what's happening in the real estate sector. But just be aware that there are seasonal trends and cultural trends, cultural events happening that、um, aren't necessarily discussed in the article. So that's something that you want to pay attention to. In addition, you have to give. There a certain lag time between monetary policy and business results. When Short-term rates are lowered when the reserve requirement ratio is lowered. That doesn't necessarily translate into business outcomes the next following month. There is a lag time of at least several months before the sector sees improved business results. Now, the next thing that I want to point to is that while there is definitely a slowdown in real estate sales.
so far in 2022 to 2021. These are charts that were provided by the Wall Street Journal. We have to remember that 2022 has started just two months ago. And that means that these data points here that are comparing 2021 and 2022 my friends, we are in February of 2022. So when you read these reports, they're very well written, they're very well researched. But the data points that are given, just think about the, the reference points. We are still very early in the year. So this comparison between 2021 and 2022, I mean, I leave it to you to think of whether that is truly reflective of, of, of the space or not. So yes, I can see that this continues to be a challenging environment for Chinese real estate, but monetary policy's impact will kick in and have an effect later this year. And you can see that if you're looking for more recent data, there is proof that lowering that short-term uh, borrowing rate, lowering the reserve requirement ratio immediately impacts bond prices sharply. So you might not see it in sales data right away, but you're going to see that impact in equity prices, in bond prices, which is why I made this video to let you know the diverging policy practices that are happening in China right now compared to the rest of the year is forming a massive opportunity that could play out in the coming months absent another serious unforeseen event. So as we approach this inflection point where China is moving to ease monetary conditions, well, you can see that headlines are starting to give way to positive fundamental and macro developments. From Reuters, from Bloomberg, and from Chinese outlets, you're starting to see news flow that there is loosening in property restrictions, that there is starting to become less bearish sentiment in the Chinese market overall. So as the narrative of Chinese equities changes, you definitely want to pay attention to how the sell side is reporting their thinking. We've got McQuarrie, Credit Suisse, and Bernstein starting to upgrade their outlook for China. And while there is definitely still structural challenges, the balancing act that China is having, trying to loosen restrictions and boost the economy while ensuring that over leveraging doesn't return to the property market to make it a big risk to the economy, there is a potential bottoming phase forming within the Chinese internet space. And on top of that, President Xi is more focused on growth this year to ensure economic stability. And like this quote mentioned, yes, there could continue to be regulation and there most likely will continue to be regulation. But the peak of regulation, the peak of property tightening, it most likely is behind us. And what that implies is that as that peak of regulation passes, so does that peak of bearish sentiment. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is China's zero COVID stance because this will help you understand whether it is the proper time to enter positions since global inflation is still high. Understanding China's zero COVID stance will give us greater insights into the inflation situation. Now, let's take a look. So here we have an article from the Wall Street Journal about China's zero COVID policy. And there are many opinions about this, and let's not introduce political views, but when it comes from an objective standpoint of the number of deaths in the country due to COVID, we can objectively say that the zero COVID policy in China is working very effectively. So from an objective perspective of lives that have been lost due to COVID, China's zero COVID policy has worked very well. Now, there are some downsides to China's zero COVID policy. In exchange for the virus being contained in the country, there are a lot of potential supply chain issues 
in the ports in China because of the zero COVID policy. So the ports that I just highlighted on my page here, Tianjin, Dalian, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, these include some of the major ports that include exports throughout North America, Europe, and the rest of the world. And if there is that zero COVID policy still in place, you have to make that sacrifice between protecting citizens' lives and then also slowing down global trade. Ultimately, what I think China is doing is the best interest for its citizens. But from an economic perspective, we just have to tame our expectations for how much the supply chain can really uh, clear out throughout this year. Now, there are some positive signs that I'll talk about in just a moment, but before we do, notice that these ports in China that I just mentioned are responsible for the global trade routes. North America, N Europe, South America, and because these trade routes are so important, that zero COVID policy is an important catalyst to follow. If we see any news that the zero COVID policy is starting to loosen, then what that also suggests is that these trade routes and these shipping ports that I mentioned here, there is going to be a lot of the supply chain congestion going to be quickly quickly cleared out if that zero COVID policy starts to loosen. So this is a policy that you want to pay attention to. The next thing that I want to talk about that brings me data and also hope that inflation is most likely going to slow down later this year is commentary from an important supply chain company called Triton. They are the world's largest container leasing company. And in a recent statement, they discussed that new container prices and production finally has peaked. And in 2021, where the container shortage was a limiter for global trade and thus causing that supply chain issue, it's no longer an issue because more supply has come into the market for containers. And that's a very important point to follow. Take a look at this quote here from an executive who mentioned that in that mid-2021 time frame, that was the period of time when he realized that that was where container supply seriously limited global trade. But given that that is no longer a fact because there's now more containers out in the market, you've got one last catalyst in making the supply chain congestion worse. And that's good news for inflation coming down. That's good news for CPI coming down later this year. So here's a framework that I use to assess the supply chain congestion. This is high level and this is broad based. Yes, there are many factors, but these are the three overarching factors I'm looking at. Well, in order for trade to happen between Asia and the rest of the world, you have to have ships. You have to have containers. And on top of ships and on top of containers, you also need to observe how are the inland logistics at these ports in China because of the zero COVID policy and how is the inland logistics at the major ports in the US due to any staff shortages or due to any backlogs. These are the three factors that I primarily look at in order to understand the supply chain congestion and therefore have a forecast to where inflation and where CPI is likely to peak later this year. And here is some very good news so before I walk through this chart, I want to bring you to this infographic here where um, you can see that the major ports in the U.S. are in Long Beach, Los Angeles, and then in New York, in Newark, New Jersey. And one metric that is closely followed is this one. And this is a metric that I follow closely. It's the number of ships waiting at the Long Beach ports. The greater the number of ships waiting there, that means the greater the backlog, the greater the congestion, and the greater the transportation cost. And we can see that between middle of last year to early of this year, 
the supply chain issues have continued to worsen and that's why we've been seeing CPI go from 6% and then to 7% and then lately to 7.5%. This chart is a major piece that explains that because the goods are not being delivered to the stores across the US and the stores globally because of this uh, you know, shipping waiting time. Now, what we have seen though, is since the beginning of the year, the number of ships at the dock congested, that number has started to fall. And if this trend continues, if this trend continues where the number of ships that are backlogged at these ports, if this number is lowered, well, in conjunction with the fact that there are more containers out in the world now because there were more of them created in 2021 and there are fewer ships backlogged at these ports, we now have a case where inflation and CPI could potentially peak later this year. And here is some additional information as to why that might be the case. So we have a statement from shipping container executives saying that one of the reasons that we had this big boom in bringing stuff in and therefore the backlog of all of this uh, shipping uh, vessels at the ports is that there was stimulus last year. The real disposable income skyrocketed, but because there's no more stimulus and instead you've got Fed tightening, you've got disposable income sagging. So we have a combination of demand for goods probably tapering off and um, you have the number of ships at the ports not being backlogged as much. We have the number of containers worldwide not at a shortage. There's a healthy inventory of them now. You add all of this together and because there's no more stimulus and there is a serious possibility that CPI and inflation at some point later this year is going to peak. It's very, very possible. And I'm telling our members in my Patreon to play that strategically. I'm going to be including lots of extensive investment research to help my members take full advantage of this situation later this year when CPI and inflation calms down and the Fed hawkish tone also shifts. We are going to be on top of that with high quality research, just like what you are seeing in this video right now. So here's how I am going to play a rebound in Chinese equities. I'm going to play a rebound in Chinese equities via the KWeb ETF. Now I do own Alibaba and I do own Tencent directly, Tencent being my largest single name Chinese equity position, but I'm also going to be actively building out my KWeb ETF position and I'm going to explain why. So first of all, KWeb is the largest China ETF in the US and compared to the other ETFs that are China themed, KWeb is the largest in terms of AUM. Now, in early December, I made a video about the 2022 Chinese internet equity outlook. And a couple months ago, I mentioned that we are going to enter a highly volatile multi-month phrase. I'm going to include the link to this video for you to watch so that you see what I said a couple months ago at the end of this video, but that's more or less what I discussed at December of last year. Now, in my previous video, I included a very important table to help my viewers understand the top 10 constituents of KWeb and also the fundamental and technical direction of these companies at the time. And you can see that back in December, there were a very large number of companies in the KWeb ETF that were deeply under the 100 day moving average. Today, that landscape looks a little different. And out of conservatism, out of conservatism, I'm going to rate that the fundamental direction hasn't necessarily changed, even though some of the companies in KWeb have 
increased their outlook for the rest of the year. So out of the conservatism, though, I'm going to say that the fundamental direction hasn't changed. That said, from a technical direction, a lot of those companies that were previously negative now are drawing much closer to the 100-day moving average, some of them even above them as well. And so what that implies is that K-Web's constituent structure has improved considerably since December. And I'm going to be helping our members take full advantage of that through entry point suggestions, exit point stop lot suggestions, and also strategizing about what catalysts to follow. One major piece of information that I've discussed in my previous video was a recovery timeline by name in the KWeb ETF because that was two, almost three months ago. We can see that the timeline for some of these recoveries are starting to somewhat take place and added with a positive technical direction and better fundamentals in China's macro data, we are potentially looking at strong outperformance for KWeb. In case you didn't know, the KWeb ETF is now significantly outperforming the NASDAQ in the US. The NASDAQ in the US, last I checked, was down anywhere between 13 and 15%, so that's a US technology. KWeb is actually up anywhere between 3 and 5% last I checked for the Chinese ETF for the internet space. So these numbers are fluid. These numbers change by the hour. These numbers change by the day. But the general theme is this. The general theme is that we are in a period where the U.S. Federal Reserve is tightening monetary policy, whereas China and their central bank, they're loosing monetary policy. Now, do I believe that U.S. tech is going to stay negative throughout the year? No, I do not. I do not believe that U.S. tech is going to stay negative by the end of the year. However, I do believe that there is a stronger chance for outperformance in certain pockets of the market. And Chinese internet and the KWeb ETF is one of those potential areas. Now, if you like my research and you want to be a part of my investment community where you get much more investment strategy and content to play this rebound in Chinese internet so that you have a guide, so that you have a mentor, definitely join my investment community. Everybody there knows that I'm deeply committed to everyone's success. Whenever people ask me questions, I answer them right away. And people know that I really want to help our members protect capital first and then find opportunity second. And if you are a financial advisor or a wealth manager, I can help you grow your assets under management and acquire more clients through organic growth advertising strategy and also become a research provider to help you add value to your clients and impress them with your research efforts. I can help you stand out in a crowded market. Links in the description below if you are a financial advisor or wealth manager looking to grow your business. And with that said, if you wanted to take a look at my previous commentary on Chinese equities, that video that I discussed, then watch this video here so that you can compare my views from just a couple months ago to this research strategy presentation today. And with that said, I will see you in my next video.